test for the Acres for America grantee webinar and just wanted to make sure that everybody's able to hear uh, this webinar and it has good sound um, but it seems like it seems like things are looking looking like they're working well so just a test West. I'm the Rocky Mountain Regional Office Director for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I'm going to get this started in about two minutes. We're just going to let another uh, group of participants join here and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. So thank you for your patience. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the Acres for America grantee webinar. Um, just a couple of pieces of, uh, of uh, housekeeping here. We just want to make sure that everybody does know that there is a call call in number uh, for audio, and that should have been on your invite uh, email for the webinar. If uh, it may be easier to to call in that way. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started and um, go to jump right into this here. Is it not going at this point? Okay, here we go. Uh, just a couple pieces of, of uh, additional pieces of housekeeping. If everybody could please mute their phone, that would be really helpful. And don't put the webinar on hold. Uh, otherwise, we will get to enjoy your hold music in the, in the whole webinar, potentially. Um, if you do have a question during this, please feel free to, to put it into the question box on the control panel of the webinar. 
Um, I'll be sure to get to the questions, uh, stop a couple of times during the during the webinar and, and answer questions that are relevant or or look at uh, at least addressing that some of those will be covered uh, in the future parts or later on in the webinar. Um, if you have a problem in terms of a, a technical difficulty, that put that please put that request into the chat box on the control panel. Um, at the end of the day, we are going to be recording this webinar, and that webinar and the tip sheet are going to be available on the Acres for America program page. So a quick introduction for those who may be unfamiliar with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We are a 501c3 dedicated to conserving and restoring the nation's native fish and wildlife habitats and wildlife and the habitats on which they rely. We invest the, a mix of conservation dollars from both public and private sources uh, to achieve that mission. Um, the rest of this on the slide you can read, but we are a, a organization that was chartered by Congress in 1984 and have a 30-member board appointed by the Secretary of the Interior, which includes the Fish and Wildlife Service and the NOAA Administrator. Uh, the way that we do our work is really through collaboration, which is the key uh, component to all of our work and really focus on on-the-ground um, outcomes. And in terms of leverage, uh, we generally have a three-to-one leverage of our uh, public funding with, with private dollars. Um, across the nation. And I'll get into a little bit more about leveraging and uh, finances of this program later on. Well, here's a, just another way of describing what I just said visually, which is that mix of federal and uh, non-federal partner resources coming together to be leveraged into addressing uh, conservation needs across the country. Uh, the Acres for America program uh, touches on all three of species and habitats, water quality and scarcity and people and conservation, but obviously has a uh, being a land and easement acquisition program uh, has a primary focus on securing uh, wildlife habitat across the country. Okay, sorry about that, we're still dealing with uh, getting this moving uh, here today, but a quick recap of the Acres for America program um, that was founded in, in 2005 as a partnership between Walmart and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And that was uh, now we're into our 14th year of the program as the program was renewed um, in back in 2015 with a second 10 year commitment from Walmart. The goals of the program since 2005 have remained largely the same, and they're really uh, looking at seeking to make uh, conservation investments in some of the, the highest quality and, and highest visible, most visible conservation acquisitions in the country. Uh, the goals of the program are la laid out here in these four bullets, but to conserve critical habitat for birds, fish, plants, and wildlife, to connect existing protected lands and unify wild places and protect migration routes for wildlife. Uh, also to provide access for people to enjoy the outdoors and ensure the future of local economies that depend on uh, open spaces, including forestry, ranching, and wildlife. I think it's important that uh, the any project that's under consideration for an Acres for America grant really does need to meet, first of all, that first bullet of conserving critical habitat. And the second and third and fourth bullets there are all uh, factors that are taken into consideration and will be a a little bit of additional information here on criteria and a couple of slides. So over the last uh, 13 years, this is, like I said, this is the 14th uh, request for proposals that's being put out for the Acres for America program. Walmart's investment is totaled $41.4 million, um, leveraging an enormous amount of other contributions, both in terms of uh, cash and in-kind uh, land value of $504.6 million. And uh, interestingly, the initial goal of the program was to protect 100,000 acres of land to offset, uh, in large part, Walmart's domestic development footprint. But since that time, this has been wildly successful. And the com combined total of uh, acres protected by the different projects funded through the program is now over 1.3 million acres through 81 projects in 35 states plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. 
Um, that's also served to connect and buffer an additional 10 million acres of existing um, conservation lands across the country. And this is a map that depicts uh, where those projects were uh, or are located um, across the, the United States. Um, and uh, as you can see, a, a great mix of, of uh, geographies are represented by the Acres for America program. Also, uh, in terms of diversity, is the diversity of grant recipients. This is a, a slide that shows just a, a slice of the uh, recipients of the Acres for America grant uh, grants over the years, and uh, and those who are partnering with our uh, with our uh, grant recipients. And these are some of the other matching funds, uh, the sources of some of the other matching funds. Uh, it's really a, a testament to the diversity, uh, not only of, of, of recipients, but also the diversity of, of how land conservation is accomplished across the country. And the Acres for America program is, a, is a, a, you know, proud to be a, a partner in, with so many different groups in, in preserving the best uh, places across the country. So. At this point, I'll jump into the current uh, 2018 funding uh, RFP and the grant round that we are uh, now soliciting uh, pre-proposals for, for the 2018 round. Those pre-proposals um, will be due in April, on uh, I think April 26. We'll get to that date for sure here later on. There are three point, about $3.1 million available you know, in this RFP and we anticipate making between four and eight grant awards uh, this year. Um, I do want to talk about a little bit more about the focus of the program here. So there are a number of criteria that we look for as we evaluate our projects. I think it's important to note that um, projects really do need to address a couple of these at least, and we do, but we do understand that not every project is going to have a the ability to. Um, to address uh, every criteria to do, um, you know, as completely as others, let's put it that way. Um, so really the key one here is protect and contribute to the projection of significant acreage of land and address one or more of the, these program priorities, which are being a, a national or state conservation priority, um, expanding connectivity, uh, protecting key habitat, of course, um, expanding public access to, to open space and nature is an important consideration. Uh, the benefiting into local economies and providing the range of, of ecological services. Um, for an application, uh, we do also uh, request that applicants uh, submit a shapefile that, that delineates the, the parcels or parcel or parcels to be acquired uh, with a context within a context of uh, the local landscape uh, that um, we also require that applicants explain the final uh, ownership or disposition of the land in question. Sometimes there are interim uh, or organizations that will hold, hold land to be added to a, a public, you know, for instance, a state park or a state wildlife area or a, a national forest or a national park. Uh, but we do ask that, that uh, applicants discuss the uh, final disposition of the land and, and how that will be accomplished. Um, if the acquisition in, in question or that is being applied for is a conservation easement, we do like to have the applicants uh, have provide a uh, summary of the conservation easement restrictions that are uh, going to be accomplished uh, accompanying um, that uh, application. And uh, there's a uh, document that I will refer you here to that's in the on the on the screen there, the guidance for requesting funds for the interest in real property, uh, that will answer a lot of the other the other questions. And um, we often do feel uh, significant questions when we get to the to the um, pre proposal and the full proposal uh, stage of this program. And uh, really hope that that many of those questions can probably be answered by looking at this guidance document. Um, another part of the application process is uh, selecting project met metrics, uh, and this is something that we ask uh, e each application to uh, select those that are the most um, uh, 
uh, relevant to your your project and this includes if it's a conservation easement uh, we, we do look to have those projects that uh, you know select the, the number of projects acres within the project but also um, acres that are connected as a result of the project and uh, so one of the things that we've included in recent years now is num number of uh, stream and uh, river miles that may be protected as part of this as well a uh, similar set of, uh, of uh, metrics for acquisitions, fee acquisitions or acquisitions of land uh, via purchase. And then um, in the, the lower ones, economic benefits, if there are measurable jobs that, and, that are, can be created or sustained as a result of this acquisition and number of uh, acres that are opened to um, public access or stream miles open to public access, those are important criteria our metrics to include in your application. So the fund, the Acres for America program does have a uh, <clears throat> grant, grants we have a minimum match requirement of one to one in the form of cash or in-kind contributions of goods and services and or land value, which is imp an important consideration oftentimes in Acres for America uh, projects. I think really importantly, the Funding for Acres for America is, is private um, funding from Walmart, and they are that this is uh, considered great federal match. Uh, we, we encourage projects that have federal um, funds as additional parts of the purchase price, uh, and those funds may be considered uh, match for this program. Those that are eligible for the for the to receive an Acres for America grant include nonprofits, uh, state and local, and municipal governments. Uh, Indian tribes and educational institutions. Um, any uh, transfers or or perpetual conservation easements uh, must meet the uh, IRS definitions for under Code 170H for conservation easements in particular. And uh, we will require uh, prior to dispersing funds all acquisition documents, including appraisals, title reports, surveys, mineral rights and other assessments. So I uh, just wanted to be clear on, on what is going to be required for any applicant under the program. So in terms of submitting a, a, an application through the Acres for America program this year, this is a two-stage program. Um, and with pre-proposals, which is a, a much shorter version, which gives us a quick synopsis of the, the project and the um, proposed project budget. Uh, and those are due uh, in late April, as you can see here, April 26th. Um, all the, the proposals in the, through this uh, grant opportunity do need to go through the ER, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's Easy Grants uh, web-based uh, application process so of the, the pre-proposals will be reviewed and then a select group um, will be uh, invited to submit full proposals those invitations will go out in early june with the full proposal deadline of june 28th uh, final funding decisions uh, will be made after uh, evaluation of the full proposals and those we are expecting to make announcements of those final funding decisions in early November. Um, at this point, I might stop and uh, just see if there's any questions that have that have come up from any um, um, anyone participating now, or I can simply jump into um, a couple of, or a, a handful of programming pro project examples here that have been uh, recent Acres for America funds uh, um, grant awards. There are questions. Okay. Um, so I've got uh, Seth Gallagher here from the Rocky Mountain Regional Office uh, standing in and helping me run the webinar. So if you hear another voice, um, um, we'll get to those. So there's a question that's come in is, uh, do we consider projects that are um, this in something like 160 acres in size that's important as a, as a community forest? Um, we do talk about the, the, the project size, and I think it's it's important to recognize that um, these are generally large projects, but a large project can really vary in um, you know what that means. Is, uh, is 160 acres on in a, in a coastal community on the east coast or northeast 
uh, in New England, for instance, is a significantly sized property. So we versus a, a large ranch property in maybe in the Western U.S. or a significant acquisition of, of timberland in the Southeast. Um, so we do really understand that there are differences in, in size of property, and we do ask that, or most of the, um, if not all of the uh, acquisitions <clears throat> made under this program are significant for, in the, for the landscape in which they're located. So we do try to take that into account. I think the average size of um, acres acquisitions ranges uh, in the neighborhood of five to 10,000 acres is our average, although there are there have been acquisitions that have been gone from a few hundred acres up to several hundred thousand acres. So it's a it's a big range, but generally these are projects that are significant in size for the landscape in which they're located. We've got a couple of other questions here as well. Um, there's a question of main organization apply to both acres and to the resilient communities uh, program in the same year. Yeah, that there's no limitation on um, being able to apply to multiple um, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation programs for the same grant. I just, I guess I would ask that if anybody was to submit multiple applications that they are in their project narrative clear that they, they've applied to other programs so that we can internally coordinate as, as easily as possible um, and avoid, avoid confusion on that front. Um, does the question is, does the, pro does the program accept requests from Alaska? The answer is yes. We, uh, the program's open to all 50 American states and territories. So we do fund, uh, we have, like I said, we funded projects in uh, Puerto Rico in the past and would be open to any U.S. territory. Um, so as long as it's in the, in, within the United States, uh, under that definition, you are open, uh, available to apply to the program. Um, uh, I'm just going to read these because they're coming in pretty quick. Okay. So uh, only 48 awards. How many applicants? And what are extra non-required characteristics of a proposal that would boost its competitiveness? Okay. So the question was, uh, if we're only making four to eight awards, how many applications do we typically receive? Uh, the average over the last five years or so has been about 40 applications. Uh, Pre-proposals have been received. And what we will do is bring that number down to probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 10 to 12 full applications that will be invited um, uh, in uh, at that June uh, cutoff date. Um, what was the second part of that, Seth? Uh, what are some non-required characteristics? Sure. That yeah, and so there's a question here, and maybe this is a good example to get into here. If so, some of these program examples will ask. Uh, but the question focused on what are some of the non-required uh, attributes of projects that make them appealing under the program. So maybe we'll jump into this here. So we can hit the next slide, go in and show some of these program examples um, a little bit more detail. So these are all uh, projects that were part of our 2016 grant slate. Um, and uh, many of these have now been successfully completed or are in the final stages of being completed. Um, but uh, the first one of these is a Blue Creek uh, project in California, uh, which is a involved the purchase of uh, a little over 47,000 acres of forest land along the lower Klamath River and that's uh, important uh, cold water tri tributary Blue Creek. Um, this project, uh, I think an attribute about it that made it uh, particularly appealing for our, from our perspective was the uh, importance of this tributary to the uh, cold water uh, salmon fishery. Uh, and salmon um, uh, spawning areas that, that are supported by the, uh, this tributary to the Klamath River, as well as the ultimate disposition of this land, which is a, a, tran a transfer um, back to, our, to a uh, tribal community, the Yurok tribe in Northern California. Um, here's another example. This is a Cienega grasslands. Uh, there's a ranch land uh, conservation easement in uh, southeastern Arizona, uh, which will not only do a, a great amount in terms of protecting some of the rare Chihuahuan uh, desert grasslands in that area, but also continue to allow for ongoing uh, cattle operations to continue on the property. And uh, this project, in addition to those two attributes, also uh, provided significant buffer to uh, public lands, both uh, U.S. Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management property um, on the north end of the Chiricahua Mountains. 
Um, this was a, a, another project moving to the east in Skinner Mountain in Tennessee. This was a uh, acquisition of working uh, hardwood forests that had significant um, geologic uh, interests and in that, that overlapped with wildlife interests in this case in terms of a karst uh, cave uh, system that's present on and, on and under this property, which uh, provided key habitats for a number of bat species of, of great importance in the southeast. Um, and also provided uh, significant habitat for a number of migratory songbirds. Um, this project was also appealing to us because of the ability to have uh, continued uh, sustainable forestry operations and public recreation ongoing on this, this new acquisition in Tennessee. Um, Moving back to the, the West, this is a, a project that was completed late in 20, it was awarded in 2016 and, and closed shortly thereafter. Uh, but uh, this is an example of a, a national conservation priority being addressed through the program where the National Park Service had identified uh, an inholding within Grand Teton National Park called Antelope Flats as its highest priority for acquisition. And the um, uh, we were able to, to join with a really diverse group of funding partners to uh, quickly work with the Park Service and the Grand Teton National Park Foundation to make that acquisition a priority or a reality, sorry. And the last one just to highlight here is another um, acquisition that was done in conjunction with a, with a federal agency, um, but this was the acquisition of a little over th or almost 3,500 acres of wetlands and uh, and cypress uh, forest in southern Louisiana, which will be incorporated into a national historic park and preserved just outside of New Orleans. Uh, this is a, a project that has great importance for the uh, Louisiana coastal region and has, in addition to it, expanded, expanded some opportunities for public recreation and coastal uh, community resiliency um, in this region. So that's a, a little bit of a touch on, we'll probably leave it on that, that slide right now where I've got some additional questions here that we might be able to address. Um, we'll program award funds for a conservation easement instead of our purchase, I think. Yeah, so the, qu the question of are funds available to be awarded for um, a conservation easement or for a, a, a outright purchase of land? And the answer is yes to both. We can uh, we can and do often fund both conservation easements and uh, fee acquisitions under this program. I think uh, probably the maybe about a I, I don't know off the top of my head I would say a 60 to 40 uh, split between acquisitions and conservation easements. But the project the program does not have a preference for one uh, uh, tool over the other. I think it's also um, an important point maybe to jump into here is about timing of uh, the, the program we do, uh, these are grants that are generally projects that can be uh, completed within a two year time frame, and there isn't a restriction on being uh, first money in or last money I and mean, basically ne needing to have all of the other funding secured for a program. Although a program, a project that has all of its funding in place will certainly have, um, you know, kind of, a, a, I guess, additional appeal would be this, the, uh, a good way of saying it, knowing that it will be uh, conserved in the very near future. Uh, but we do, there is not a restriction saying that all the match has to be secured before an application to acres can be put in. And in some cases, uh, Acres for America grants have been the initial uh, funding committed to a, to a project. So another one is, uh, will the link that was put up before be available to folks? I think that was the acquisition rule. Yeah, the, the rules, uh, the uh, guidance document this is a question about related to the guidance document on uh real estate acquisitions that document is available on the acres for america page on the uh, nifwif website and will also be um i think is available on the on the general nifwif website as well i'd be happy to um my my contact information will be put up here at the end of this i'd be happy to send out that guidance document to any uh, uh, applicant who's interested, but it will be available on our website. When do you anticipate the earliest award of funding? Not the decision, but the actual award of funding. Okay, so the, there's a question about how quickly after uh, award, award decisions are made, will funds be available? Um, 
I would say generally 60 to 90 days is about as about as soon after the award announcement, which would be in, um, like I said, in early November this year, um, that we can do that. If uh, there's extraordinary circumstances, that's something that we really would like to know in the application phase. Um, and Acres for America funds can be um, uh, sent out as a reimbursement as well, if that's uh, something that, that uh, an individual project needs to uh, maybe secure bridge funding to be able to close in a, in a timely manner. Um, but we can we can be as flexible as possible on our end, but we do need to, it is helpful to know if there are time constraints on the project um, in the project narrative. Would match properties need to be purchased after the approval of the grant or could one be used if purchased after the application submittal? Okay, so there's a question about what, what is the timing for uh, applicability of, of matching funds and if a and if an acquisition occurs you know concurrently or, or close to con concurrently with the um, proposed a uh, application to this program uh, our general rule of thumb is that an acquisition that can be can be uh, counted as match if it goes if it occurs within a year of your application date so uh, a year prior to the acquisition uh, acquisition date or during the grant period, which generally these are 18-month uh, or 24-month grant period. So uh, you can go backwards a year when you're counting match, and uh, you can have match that occurs during the entire grant period. Hopefully that is, it's, it's, uh, it can be, every one of these acquisitions, is, as everybody on the on the uh, webinar is aware is, is a little bit different and we understand that but that's a little bit of general guidance in terms of uh, what we look for in terms of matching uh, the timing of matching funds next question is would the acres or miles impacted by the easement be suitable for a metric not necessarily in the easement but affected by the easement okay that's a great question which is getting at uh, the kind of the benefits of of uh, it kind of maybe say a conservation easement buffering an existing uh, state wildlife area, for instance, and, and would the uh, could you count the the acres that are basically buffered or improved or further secured as part of the metric? And we have struggled with how to get that in, into a a metric that can be universally applied across every transaction. And at this point, my advice to any applicant would be to be sure to expand upon that thought or, or that impact in, in the project narrative itself, um, because we do, we do not have a specific metric for that, but it's um, something that, that if it's an important component of your acquisition that we wanna make sure that, the, that, that that's captured in, in your, your project narrative. Two more questions. We'll okay, we've got two more questions and we'll get into. Um, do you typically award projects that have inexpensive costs per acre? What about land in Southern California where acreage is not inexpensive? <laughs> so this is a, the question was, uh, are, are we really looking at uh, cost per acre as a, as a significant consideration in this and in the program? And I, I would say that we have a, we have pro, we have funded projects that range from, um, you know, a couple, maybe a couple hundred dollars or a hundred dollar per acre conservation easements up to uh, projects where the acquisition can be measured um, in price per square foot. So th there is not a, um, a an inherent, uh, I would, either an inherent bias or a preference for lower priced uh, properties, but uh, it does obviously the, it makes the uh, ability to, for the dollars to go further um, in, uh, in in more rural areas. Uh, that being said, we, have, we last year we funded a project in Southern California. We've funded acquisitions, um, including the the Antelope Flats acquisition in, in within Grand Teton National Park, that were really exceptionally high value properties. And so, really, we we do have a mix of of uh, price. Price per acre uh, is, is highly variable, just as the real estate markets across the country are highly variable. One more question. Final question for now is for farm and ranch conservation easement projects, what sort of deed restrictions will NIFWF require? Um, so the question was, what kind of deed restrictions would we require on an, an acquisition? I'm assuming I'll answer that in two ways, because I think there's maybe two ways to say it. One is if it's a conservation easement that's being acquired, we uh, don't have any specific 
requirements that we have other than than naming NIFWF as a as a funder um, on the conservation easement uh, deed. But we do re ask that each applicant detail what the restrictions that they are proposing to put on the, the property through the conservation easement would be. In terms of a fee acquisition, we um, do not require a secondary conservation easement, uh, but we do require uh, a, a clear understanding of what the final disposition and management of the property will be. So hopefully that gets at the, that question. If there are any other questions, I'm going to move on to the, the next section of this, which is gets into a little bit of the um, the nuts and bolts of um, getting a pre-proposal into the <coughs> NIF with easy grants system. So in order to apply to the program, you are going to need to have a uh, easy grants account. And I would just encourage and if anybody's even considering this to not wait until the day before the, the uh, proposal deadline to initiate your easy grants account and, and uh, you can establish this. It doesn't commit you to doing anything further, but uh, just go into the uh, website listed there, easygrants.nifwif.org and create your account. Um, if your organization already has an account, um, they're, they're, you're, please check and make sure that if you've got an existing account or not and see if you can, um, if that needs to be updated, I would uh, encourage that rather than creating a brand new ac account, if at all possible. Um, if you're to so once you've established your account, you need to go in and say ap apply for um, for funding. And what you'll need to do is go in and choose under the funding opportunity Acres for America Fall 2018. Uh, there will be a short eligibility quiz, which will basically determine if you're uh, an entity that is eligible to receive uh, funds under this program. And then you will go in and click the pre-proposal task, which is uh, the which will get you into the um, system as a to submit or to, to prepare and then ultimately submit your pre-proposal for Acres for America. Um, on the left column, uh, there are, are sh shows several different sections of the application, including the in organization's contact uh, and the organizational information, information about the project, uh, specific uploads, which include the um, uh, project narrative and any maps that may be accomp uh, accompanying the project, and then also matching contributions. Um, as you can see here, this is a screenshot showing the um, example of this, the status. Uh, the, pro the application will not be able to be uh, submitted until the status uh, on the right there has all the green arrow, uh, the uh, four green check boxes, checks there rather than any exit. So any incomplete um, components will not will, will prohibit you from being uh, able to submit your application. And um, so there is also a key component, I think I've mentioned it several times here, is the, the project narrative and the project map. So these are our um, templates are, are that we have, pro we have provided a narrative template which you can complete offline and then upload into the system. And I would encourage the exact same uh, thing to prepare a good and clear project site map and then upload that into the system um, as well. And this is just a little bit of showing you how this works within the Easy Grants system. Um, one of the key thing I think to mention in this, these these slides are uh, they're not terribly exciting, but they are pretty critical for getting an application into our system. If you are having uh, problems with your application or with getting an application into the Easy Grant system, uh, we do have. Uh, staff available to help work, work you through this system and make sure that you are able to get uh, your proposal in and get all of your documents uploaded in a, uh, in a way that's going to uh, make your project uh, able to be considered. Uh, this is just going through the, the same thing um, in terms of uh, uploading a project site map as well. Um, right there, we'll go back one really quickly. Uh, I think an important one is also when you've got all of your, your components of your application together, there is an opportunity to review and, and uh, your entire submission prior to it 
uh, being formally submitted to the foundation. Uh, once again, make sure that all the sections are checked as complete. And then we encourage you to uh, save your com com uh, completed proposal uh, through the, uh, as a PDF function there where you can make a copy of your uh, completed uh, project application. And then uh, when you click submit, it will go into our system and you will receive a, an email confirmation that your application has been received. Um, this is, oh, I, I did skip ahead here. This is the button that says if, if you are stuck or are experiencing some difficulties in this, we do have a help uh, button there, which is located in the lower left, and that will get you um, the assistance through our staff in Washington, D.C. Um, after the pre-proposals are reviewed, there will be a, a select number of applications that will be invited for full proposals, and these next few slides just uh, kind of click through what uh, information is going to be required for full proposal. It is, it is more detailed, and we don't um, want to make sure that, that we are putting all of the pre-proposal applications through the full proposal um, process. And so this is, it's, a, it's more extensive and does require additional uh, uploads and um, uh, more detailed budget um, information as well, which is detailed here. Um, I think a key thing here, the, the line right there at the top of the page, is that grant funds can really only be applied to the project's purchase price. I apologize for the sirens here, um, but uh, that we can um, consider other direct costs um, is the only, I guess, filling out the budget for only other direct costs is the only um, opportunity where, where all the purchase price should be shown in this application. Um, again, we're happy to walk you through this as well, but the, here's a fee acquisition is the type and land conservation being the, per, the purchase. The quantity should be listed as one and the unit cost is whatever the um, application amount uh, would be. <clears throat> Um, finally, there's a tip sheet that has been developed that will recap much of what I just skimmed through here in terms of the application process uh, using EasyGrant. This tip sheet is uh, on the Acres for America program page and is something that uh, I think is a great place if you've got questions about the process or um, how to um, submit a, either metrics or budget numbers or download um, um, thing, uh, pre-proposal project narrative templates, uh, that sort of thing. And all of that is covered on the uh, pre-proposal tip sheet uh, on our website. Um, these are, I'm going to run through these, which is sort of a, uh, a list of uh, commonly asked questions. So this may preempt another couple of questions that may have come in. Um, we're often asked if site proximity to Walmart is considered in our, in our process, and, and that is explicitly actually not considered. We are looking for those highest uh, quality projects around the country, regardless of where um, any facility or uh, interest of, of Walmart may be. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you are new to being uh, easy grants or new to being applying for funding through the foundation, we really want encourage you to create your uh, applicant your uh, easy grants um, account now and familiar familiarize yourself with the system. Uh, it may require you to turn off pop-up blockers. Um, it's something that's just kind of a quirk of the system, but it's something that oftentimes uh, hangs people up. Uh, we do also encourage you to discuss your, your project with other conservationist agencies and funders uh, because those are going to be important um, letters of support and, and uh, for the full, app, full proposal stage. So we don't want a a pre-proposal to come in and, and look really good and then um, have kind of be derailed by not having been discussed with with uh, key partners in the in the region. Um, also, feel free to contact the regional st office staff uh, for where for the regions in which your program is located. Uh, NIFWF is organized into five regions across the country, a northeastern region, a southern region, 
uh, both of which are based uh, out of our Washington, D.C. office, a central regional office based in Minnesota, uh, the Rocky Mountain regional office is based here in Denver, Colorado, and then our western regional office is based in San Francisco. Um, the regional office staff can give you some good advice as to the um, what, what may be uh, appealing or unappealing components of, of your specific uh, project. Um, again, the pre-proposal deadline is April 26th, and only proposals that are submitted through Easy Grants will be considered. Uh, we will then be going to a review program, um, a review period, and we will then invite a select number, probably, as I mentioned, in the 10 to 12 full proposals, uh, projects will be selected to submit full proposals. Uh, and that deadline for those full proposals will be June 28th. Uh, again, final decisions will be made in the, in the fall at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation Board of Directors meeting in November. So that concludes the, what I've got in terms of a, uh, a script for the webinar. If you've got any additional questions, I'm going to answer some right now, but uh, my email is listed on, on the, uh, the page there. I look forward to any specific questions that may come up about your project. Uh, we do realize that uh, real estate is uh, completely unique and no, no two projects are the same. And so we're happy to uh, entertain your questions and, and uh, discuss uh, you know, specifics about, about your project uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, okay, so one of the questions came in related to, um, and it's related to a question from the state of Maine, um, and talks about endorsement of uh, by the by the state agencies or by local governments, and how sometimes that may be a a difficulty. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that project or that question offline with with that individual specifically, but I think in general. One of the things that we we look to is what are for a state in particular. Let's let's say what are the state what's the state wildlife agency's um, goals? Has has a project does a project line up with a state wildlife action plan or other uh, state planning documents for the the conservation of, of natural resources in that state? Um, trying not to be uh, into get into large long discussions about political agendas or any or other things we do want to make sure that what w the projects that we are supporting through this program are in line with with state goals for the conservation of natural resources um, again I'd be happy to talk offline or one-on-one -on -one with anybody about specifics related to uh, specific uh, situations related to your project that's all the questions we have for now, um, but I do appreciate everybody who's been a part of the uh, the webinar. Again, this webinar is being recorded and we'll post this on our website, and I would encourage anyone to uh, reach out to either myself or to your, the regional, uh, the National Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Service Regional Director uh, for the area where your project is located to discuss this further with them. and. Uh, we look forward to another great year of this program and announcing another great slate of uh, successful applications later this year. So thank you for, for participating and I'm gonna sign off at this point, thanks.